Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to St. Leonard's, particularly if you haven't been to this glorious church before. We can have a more wonderful setting for an event. And this evening is the third of our special events to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the founding of the Archive of Recorded Church Music by myself. We had myself talking last night, we had Joshua Roebuck playing the organ this afternoon, and this evening we have got Dr. Roy Massey coming to talk to us about his life as a cathedral organist. So it gives me the greatest of pleasure to introduce Dr. Roy Massey. That's not entirely accurate, because I'm going to talk about two very good cathedral organists who are not me, and then I should just pop in a bit at the end. But I'm going to talk about George Robertson Sinclair, who was organist of Hereford Cathedral from 1889 to 1917, his successor Percy Hull, 1918 to 1949, and then when they really got to the bottom of the barrel, it was me in 1974 to 2001. Um, the original invitation to come and talk was to talk about my 27 years as old Mr. Herrick and I thought, well, I can't think of anything more boring than that. <laughs> um, and, but in the air at the time, there was a lot of historical awareness appearing, both on the radio and television, particularly with the year 1918. That's a hundred years ago. It's long enough to be real history, but still really, really recent history. And I, this then made me think about these two organists who um, were both affected by what was happening just before 1918. So I thought they were quite an interesting topic. But um, the first organist, George Robertson Sinclair, was organist at Hereford Cathedral 1889 to his sudden death in 1917. And as a person, he's a rather shadowy figure. But of course, Elgarians will be very familiar with his initials GRS um, in variation 11 of Elgar's in the variation. So I think let's just hear what Elgar thought of him. <laughs> Some ways it is an organist variation with feet and trumpets, 
And the other thing is, it is the Bulldog Day. And at the Three Choirs Festival in 1991, I was called out to the other side of the river when we weren't rehearsing. Please bring your dog. So I went over the other side of the river. There was the mayor, various people. There was Wollstone Atkins, Elgar's godson. And they put a plaque on the ground where this is the spot where the bulldog dam ran down into the river. And it was covered in plastic grots. And they said to me, would you like to say a few words? So I said a few words. And then they, would you like to unveil it? So I said, well, perhaps we can do better than that. So I turned to my dog and I said, go on. And he went, dup, 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 dup. move the plastic thing. So my dog unveiled it. <laughs> and then they said, well, can you do what the bulldog dad did? So I said, well, let's try. So I got a stick and I threw the stick into the water and down the bank he went and everybody was happy. So. <laughs> Sinclair was born in 1863 in Croydon. His father was director of public education in Bombay and the family were on their way home to Ireland. He was very proud of his Irish ancestry. Every three choirs in Hereford he did, he always hung out an Irish flag. Uh, I think it was a green and, and a gold thing on it, you know. He wasn't IRA or anything. But, um, at an early age, Sinclair displayed more than average musical talent and through family connections entered the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin at the age of eight. In 1873, aged 10, he won a choral scholarship to the choir of St Michael's College, Tenbury, which had been founded um, some years by then, but relatively newly founded, where he began to imbibe from its founder, Sir Frederick Arthur Gore Oosley, ideals of excellence in the performance of music in divine worship. Sinclair's early intention was to seek ordination, but his plans in respect to higher education were changed by the death of his father in 1879. He left St Michael's at the age of 16 and went to Gloucester as a pupil and assistant to Dr Charles Harford Lloyd, the organist. A year later, at the age of 17, through the influence of Boosley, he became the first organist of the cathedral being built in Truro under the redoubtable Bishop Edward White Benson, who was born in Birmingham and Elboy King Edward School, where I used to teach. Benson had been the headmaster of Wellington College and treated Sinclair rather like a school prefect, who had to report regularly to his boss and had to do as he was told. The building of Pearson's great cathedral commenced in 1880. And at first, Sinclair worked in a temporary wooden building, wherein, with, great, with the great energy he exhibited throughout his life, he created a new cathedral choir. In 1886, he appointed the 17-year-old Ivor Atkins as his assistant and article pupil, who would eventually, of course, become another very famous name in three choir circles. In 1887, he masterminded the creation of a magnificent new organ built by Father Willis, who incidentally had built the organs in St Michael's Tenbury and Gloucester Cathedral, and who eventually would build another great instrument for Hereford. In the same year, Sinclair was also responsible with conspicuous success for the music of the consecration of the choir and transepts of Truro. Years later, he wrote, I quite thought that I should never leave Truro. I was very happy there. I had my little yawl. I believe that's a sort of boat. And it seemed to be a fixture. But almost against my inclination, I was urged to apply for the Hereford post, then vacant by the death of my predecessor, Langdon Colborne. I believe I was run very close by another man, but I got it. The other man was Herbert Brewer who at that time was organist of St Michael's Coventry, which later became Coventry Cathedral. And Brewer, eight years later, was to get the post of his dreams as organist of Gloucester Cathedral. This is what he really wanted and he eventually got. On 29th of October 1889, the day after his 26th birthday, Sinclair signed his agreement with the chapter. His salary was £215 per annum, and there was also a spacious house with a large garden in Church Street. He was required to play for all the cathedral services in person and expected to teach the piano to the two senior choristers, Gratis and Vanoffing. 
and all the other choristers were encouraged to learn an instrument of some sort. He was also allowed to teach on the cathedral organ. He brought with him from Truro his assistant and article pupil, Ivor Atkins, together with a new choir. What did Sinclair find on arrival? He inherited a choir of eight choristers, four probationers and seven lay clerks, and five vicars choral who lived in the adjacent college. The musical setup was typical of an old foundation cathedral at that time. From the 14th century onwards, Hereford Cathedral was run by two distinct communities. The senior, senior body was the chapter, who under the chairmanship of the dean ran the place. The other body was the College of Vicars Corps, whose members were all in holy orders and had the responsibility for the ordering of the services. This very independent-minded group had been a thorn in the side of the chapter for generations. <laughs> and in the matter of the organist clung to the view that as he was paid largely by themselves, he would be required to deliver whatever they wanted. They also believed the precentor and succentor appointed from among their own members, still had full control over the choir and music, which gave them a definite ascendancy over the chapter in this matter. Inevitably, the two views led to conflict. An older tradition faced a new one in the person of Sinclair, a young man with boundless energy and modern ideas, who was determined to make changes and improve musical standards, which at that period were pretty poor. The first thing he had to do was improve the cathedral organ. The instrument he inherited was the Graham Davidson instrument of 1863, built on the north side of the chancel after its refurbishment by Gilbert Scott, following the great restoration of the building, which had taken 20 years to accomplish. Further work was done on the instrument in 1879, but by 1891 its deficiencies were becoming painfully obvious and a major rebuild would, not, would be necessary to bring the instrument up to date. The Dean and Chapter, though not in a position to finance the work themselves, gave the project their full approval and encouragement. And Sinclair set to work to raise the necessary funds himself with the assistance of the Dean and several ladies in the congregation. He was indefatigable in giving organ recitals all over the place to raise cash, produce one special service of two entertainments in the College Hall in aid of the organ fund, and by May 1891, a first list of 89 subscribers, plus collecting cards, organ recitals and extras, had raised £1,538, 13 shillings and fivepence <laughs> towards the £2,300 required. Values of all to them, don't they? <laughs> a full manual with us for £2,300. Cost you, cost you that for a pedal trombone, isn't it? The new organ was opened on St. Cecilia's Day, 22nd of November 1892, and it rapidly became apparent that Henry Willis had produced a masterpiece for his friend Dr. Sinclair, and which mercifully has come down to us largely un un unaltered to the present day. Sinclair was a very fine player and was noted for his virtuosic pedal technique and his love of delicate tonal colouring and his sensitive accompaniment services. He wasn't noted as a composer, though he did produce several hymn tunes and Anglican chants. But he did produce a festival march in B flat, and it was written, I think, at the end of his time in Truro, just before he went to Erivan. And it's got tunes in it which so easily would have come out of Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> well, um, Thanks to my first assistant with Erivan, who's sitting in front of me listening very critically, uh, bless him, um, he found a copy of this. I don't know where he found it, but he found it, because it's been lost, lost, lost and forgotten. And suddenly Robert Green found it and very kindly gave me a copy. So I didn't want to record it on the Hereford organ, so you could actually hear this in Dr. Sinclair's organ. 
But sadly, by the time I got round to thinking about it, there was a little extravaganza going on in the cathedral called the Three Choirs Festival. <laughs> and if you want to book a time to make a recording on the organ in Hereford Cathedral during the Three Choirs Festival, you have to think again. However, I'll play it on your nice little organ here. It won't sound quite the same as Hereford, um, but I tell you, I've got the wrong shoes on. I didn't, I didn't warn you.
Dave Sinclair was obviously very proud of his pedal technique from the last week. <laughs> right, in 1891, Sinclair made a pilgrimage to Bayreuth, returning with an enthusiasm for and a picture of Wagner. From then on, he was firmly on the side of the moderns, and his first Hereford Three Choirs Festival judiciously blended Mendelssohn with Schumann, Mozart the Requiem with Beethoven the Eroica, Parry with Stanford, but the prelude to Parsifal by Wagner had never been played ever before in a cathedral and indicated quite a new direction for which way the Three Choirs Festival was eventually going to go. Edward Elgar had been associated with Hereford as an orchestral player before Sinclair arrived on the scene. When Sinclair assumed office, a close artistic and personal relationship developed between the two men. In 1897, Sinclair introduced the music of Elgar to a Hereford Three Choirs programme with his new Te Deum and Benedictus for chorus and orchestra. The Three Choirs became an expression of Sinclair's energetic enthusiasms, both for new music and as a revelation of his astonishing success as a chorus master. As with his cathedral choir, standards of performance at the festival rose steadily. And the Hereford Festival 1897 was to herald a new era than the annals of the event. Sinclair was conducting his third festival, and it was Herbert Brewer's first as organist of Gloucester, and Ivor Atkins's first as organist of Worcester. Thus the stage was set for the successful early 20th century development of the three choirs under this outstanding triumvirate, with Elgar in close association with it until his death in 1934. They were to be great days. Sinclair's fame as a chorus master spread throughout the Midlands, and in 1900 he was invited to take over the conductorship of the Birmingham Festival Choral Society, which in those days was the leading chorus in the Midlands and one of the finest choirs in the country. His work with the Cathedral Choir also achieved new heights in spite of the periodic obduracy of the College of Vicars Choral. Especially the Sextenta, who maintained that by statute and long-standing tradition, he was responsible for the behaviour of the boys during cathedral services. Sinclair, on the other hand, maintained that it was his responsibility as master of the choristers. However, in 1907, the Suck Centre died, and the chapter grasped the opportunity to remove the problems between the organist and Suck Centre once and for all. In a shrewd and unexpected move, they appointed Sinclair Suck Centre, <laughs> and in this post put the organist firmly in control of the music of the cathedral including the discipline of the choristers during the services. This took the college completely by surprise and was dismissed as a mischievous anomaly. And they made great efforts to reverse the chapter's decision, but the chapter stood firm and Sinclair's work flourished. His work with the boys was particularly successful and he was a keen chorister spotter bringing boys into the cathedral choir from many places. Once there, they were cared for by him, and his kindness was legendary. He also used his influence in the town to get many of them apprenticeships after they left the choir. His Christmas concerts with the boys, performed in the Shire Hall, became a popular feature of Christmas in Hereford. And the memorial of these is Elgar's Christmas Greeting, composed for them in 1907, written for two part trebles, accompanied by two violins and piano. There was no organ in the Shire Hall. An early manuscript of this in Elgar's handwriting is a treasured item in the cathedral archives. Um, this little piece was written while Elgar was on, on holiday in Rome with his wife. Um, he'd been ill and he went to a warmer time to recuperate. And his wife wrote the words. Caroline Alice Elgar, she wrote a lot of poems 
they are all a bit twee. But she, she actually compares the snow and cold in Hereford with the warmth in Rome. Uh, Bowered on sloping hillsides rise in sunny glow the purling vine. Beneath the greyer English skies, in fair array, the red gold apples show. To those in snow, to those in sun, love is but one, hearts beat and glow by oak or palm, friends in storm all come. On and on, old time of speed, dark with the weight of ancient crime. Far north, through green and quiet meads, flows on the wide, in midst and sight, silvering of rhyme. To those in snow, to those in sun, love is but one. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, it's the introduction for two violins and piano. Um, is, is, is absolutely gorgeous. And the moment it starts, you say, ah, Elgar. And he catches his style just with those simple two violins and a piano. This is a record we made, this is Hereford Choir, about the, in the 1980s. And um, I can't remember the two violins were, but Robert Green was my assistant at the time. He used to do that. So he's going to listen to himself playing the piano. <laughs> So, off we go, please.
think that at the beginning of December, they must have performed it in the, the shower a bit later on. But it's, it's a lovely little piece. Sinclair achieved great things in Hereford with his immense energy, drive and determination to improve the musical standards of the place, but not without treading quite heavily on a few people's toes. The Vicar's Choral accused him more than once of all weaning arrogance, and he was often in his early days less than tactful as he dealt with the festival stewards and the honorary secretary of the Three Choirs Festival Committee. There were those who interpreted his single-mindedness as obduracy and his determination as petulance. And this is not surprising, as much needed doing, and as a young man he was determined to do it. He transformed the standard of the cathedral choir and helped bring a new and helped bring a rather moribund three choirs into the 20th century, improving its standards of performance out of all recognition as he did so working happily together with his gifted partners of Worcester and Gloucester. His professional eminence was recognised early in his career as he was awarded a Lambeth Doctorate of Music in 1892 and later honorary fellowships of the Royal Academy of Music and the Royal College of Organists. Um, he also achieved high office as a Freemason. On 1st of February 1917, Sinclair played his 134th organ recital in the cathedral. On Tuesday the 6th of February he played for Evensong the anthem being Stainer's Lead Kindly Night. The next day he went to Birmingham for a rehearsal of the Vare Directory with the Festival Choir, after which he returned to his hotel room where he passed away for a heart attack in the night. He was admired and much respected both in Hereford and further afield and commemorated by a special, splendid memorial in the South Choir Isle of the Cathedral. There is also a carving of his head as a headstock on an arched doorway under the southwest Masonic Tower of the West Front. So that's Dr. Sinclair, one of the great ones. The only thing I have in common with him, my head is on the east front. <laughs> <laughs> Percy Clark Hull. Elgar dedicated Pomp and Circumstance March number 5 in C. Let's have a bit of that because this, I think, is how Hull, how Elgar saw Hull. Suddenly the door opened and in bounced Sir Percy Hull. He was examining in Birmingham for the Associated Board and he was staying with Fred Ledson, who was a great friend of mine, who was the Associated Board um, representative. And um, he, I was introduced to him, he bounced in, chattered, quick, started, and then bounced out again. So I met him once. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he talked very quickly, he thought very quickly, he did everything very quickly, and like Sinclair, he was astonishingly energetic. However, his widow Molly was still alive when I came to Hereford in 1974, and living at King's Acre, and she was very kind to Ruth and myself, and had us round to tea occasionally, and we had her round to dinner. She was very supportive of what I was doing at the cathedral, and very interesting to talk to, and we got her reminiscing. She often mentioned Pease's energetic approach to life, and she, she wrote short memoirs about her days um, as his wife and three choirs days. Um, Hull was born in 1878 and became a chorister in the cathedral choir in 1889. 
the year Sinclair arrived at Hereford. So he was parallel with him all the way. He said, Sinclair chopped us up very fine. <laughs> I've never tried chopping a choir up very fine. <laughs> my choir worked very fine myself, really. I want to do so once or twice with some of the parents, but that's a <laughs> <laughs> He became an article pupil of Sinclair's and his assistant from 1896 until 1918. So he was assistant organist for 22 years. Quite astonishing. Um, he was on a, in 1914, he was on a walking holiday in Germany when war was declared and as an enemy alien was interned at Roy Leather, the prisoner of war camp for its duration. One can't help wondering, anybody, around about 1914, you must have been aware that there was a little bit of trouble brewing with Germany, wouldn't you have thought? And he goes on a walking tour in Germany. It was a funny thing to do, but um, his health was affected, and for the last six months he was invalided out to Holland. He remained a sub canon of the cathedral in 1905. I'm never sure what that means. It's probably one of those antique positions which no longer existed, but they gave it to you if they liked you. But the dean and chapter did try to get him repatriated by saying he was a sub canon. But they didn't, but, but it wasn't accepted because he wasn't actually in holy orders. Had he been a priest, they would have probably let him go. Like his master, Sinclair, Hull was a Freemason and arranged via his Masonic connections to have food parcels sent to Roy Leben. On Sinclair's sudden death in 1917, the organist position became vacant, of course. Back home, some of them wanted the job to be advertised in the usual way while another group felt strongly that it should be held open and given to Hull when the time came on when the war ended. And Elgar supported very strongly that latter view. So the job was held open for him and he um, became organist on Armistice Day, 11th of November 1918 and played his first service on that day and he remained in post until 1949. He was in charge of eight Hereford Three Choirs Festivals. I beat him on that one, I was in charge of nine. <laughs> and he picked up en route an honorary FRCO in 1920, a Lambeth Dimas in 1922, and a Knighthood in 1947. So he didn't do too badly, did he really? The job, the job in 1918 was paid £350 per annum with free residence in the organist's house in Church Street. Anything extra came from teaching and later examining for the Associated Board and the RCO. His wife had an allowance of £50 per annum from her family. On this combined income they kept two maids, a cook and a housemaid. When their two sons were born, they had a nurse. So he must have done a lot of teaching. Um, but um, in 1927, when Sidney Nicholson retired from Westminster Abbey in order to create the School of English Church Music, later the RSCM, um, Hull was offered the post of the Abbey, but eventually turned it down. Bairstow at York Minster was also offered the job, and he turned it down and eventually went to Ernest Bullock of Exeter Cathedral. Hull died in 1968 and his wife in 1989. And I played for her funeral in the village church near her home on an organ with three stops, one of which wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Percy Hull inherited Sinclair's energy and like him was a workaholic. He was a little man, quick of movement and thought, and didn't suffer fools gladly. He also inherited Sinclair's dynamism in front of a chorus, an orchestra, and was highly successful with his own Hereford Choral Society and the Three Choirs Festival Chorus. The 1914-18 war put to an end many music festivals in this country, the famous Birmingham Triennial Festival being one of them. And in, after the war, it was confidently predicted that the three choirs would go the same way. 
and even well-wishers watched in trepidation when it was resumed at Worcester in 1920 because nobody really believed that such things could ever exist again. After Percy Hill's first Hereford Three Choirs, when he was in charge for the first time in 1921, the Musical Times wrote, Mr. Percy Hull had an arduous and exacting task in conducting his first festival, and although no doubts existed concerning his musicianship, his debilitating experiences at Roy Leyland, he had been a prisoner there during the whole of the war, and his subsequent illness made some fearful of his staying power. It may at once be said that he achieved an unqualified success. He gained the confidence of orchestra and choir, he kept his head and gave evidence of a distinctly musical temperament. His tempi were on the side of vivacity, which afforded a contrast with those of his predecessors, but his readings were never exaggerated, and when he acquires the assurance that comes with experience, they should become individual and arresting. I think few conductors can have made a more successful debut. The debut was no flash in the pan, and by his third festival in 1927, the same magazine said Hull had firmly established his position as a musician who was unusually versatile and practical. He goes on to say, much of his success is due to certain personal qualities not too common among musicians. Live wires abound in the profession. Dr. Hull is one of them, but he differs from most in that he is live in a quiet way. <laughs> With the absence of fuss and hustle goes an unfailing good humour. The writer goes on to say that he spent an entire rehearsal day watching him at work at the festival. Hull started the arduous day's work to the minute, 9.45 a.m. No time was wasted. Not a bar was repeated without an object which was palpable to all concerned. The passages rehearsed were cut down to the actual danger spots, an odd bar or two, a change of time, a tricky progression. Energy was conserved. Such small but important points as the turning of pages quietly was insisted upon. The most trying moments found him unruffled, and the sum of all these excellencies, the long morning rehearsal, finished ten minutes before the scheduled time. That's always a chin, believe me. Generally, it was said that his tempi were on the quick side and his energy and force of character that has enabled him to get such fine results as a choir trainer were apt in the stress of performance to boil up into excitement, impetuosity. And they have very much that he'll grow out of that trait. He then goes on to say that this article would be incomplete if it made no reference to Hull's work as cathedral organist. The excellent singing of his boys was a frequent theme of admiration during the festival, and the quality of the cathedral choir as a whole was shown on the Sunday morning by the beautiful purity and finish of its singing a cappella of a service by Corston. It was proof, if proof were needed, that Percy Hull, the daily round and common task, He's as alive and thorough as he is in a hectic three-quarters festival week. Another musical times critic wrote a long critique of the 1927 festival, starting with the words, threatened institutions live long, or at least linger. The three-quarters festival does a great deal more. It justifies itself and confounds its critics by flourishing vigorously at a time when most musical events are preceded and sometimes accompanied by signals of distress. He then goes on to say just how very fine the chorus was under Hull's training. Percy Hull must have been an astonishingly fine chorus trainer, but of course one must remember that two contingents of the chorus actually came from Gloucester and Worcester, where Sir Herbert Brewer of Gloucester had been honing his singers since 1897, and Sir Ivor Atkins of Worcester had also been doing the same for his for the same year. So almost certainly I had some John Wood experienced people in the chorus from the other two places, as well as his Hereford contingent. However, by 1927 Brewer had heart trouble, which probably slowed him down somewhat. He was to die from it the following year. And Atkins had a reputation of being rather austere and scholarly, and not so good on the rostrum with the orchestra. 
So perhaps Hull did seem like a young breath of fresh air to the chorus and orchestra in 1927. David Wilcox once said to me that the orchestra and chorus liked him as he didn't waste time talking. And above all, his beat was crystal clear. They liked Atkins less as he tended to lecture them and his beat was far from foolproof. <laughs> Though, of course, he was a splendid musician in every other way. I met him once when I was young and he was very scary. He really was very scary. I was scared to find I wasn't very old. We don't have any recordings of Hull's Cathedral Choir, I'm afraid. But we do have um, little excerpts of two bits from the head of the three choirs in 1927 when some recordings were made for the first time. Earlier in the year, HMV, his master's voice, had got themselves a van, and there was a picture of it in Collins' exhibition, parked outside the west front of the cathedral, and they tried to do something, and they tried to record the Dream of Grantius in the Albert Hall, and it didn't work. So they thought they'd have to go recording bits in Heritage. And there are some quite long bits of the um, Driven Grants and one or two other things. But here's just a couple of excerpts. This, these are from the, these are actually on the, the old 78s of 1927, which come out of Collins' collection. Here's the soft opening of the music makers. And, and through all the crack and hassle, this is the three choirs chorus, trained by Percy Hopkins, and his conductor's actually Elgar. But this is what they sounded like. To give you just some idea, he was a very fine chorus trainer. Okay. 
As Sir Walter Alcock said in Salisbury when he was contemplating rebuilding his father with this, he said, how can you improve a Stradivarius? The same is true of a father with this. Mercifully, through 1933 rebuild, the organ came down to us in its brilliant, pristine condition. So, there was Percy Hull, marvellous man. Now, we come to the rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I became one of their successors. And um, it didn't happen in a strange way particularly, but I, I, I've been organist of Birmingham Cathedral for six years when I was really happy. Um, and um, uh, and I didn't really think about moving very much, although we only sang four times a week in Birmingham. We had splendid men, and the boys were bad. And uh, I had 14 men and 22 boys, and it was, it was a good setup. But I did just yearn a bit for a daily service and the message of the choir, and, uh, and, and the Hereford came on the horizon, and I didn't do anything about it. Suddenly the phone rang, and it was Christopher Robinson who was the cathedral. He said, you are going to put your name in Perryford, aren't you? So I said, I haven't. Uh, oh, well, you know the name that's being mentioned. So I said, oh, I'll think about it. So I put the phone down. The next day the phone rang again, and it was John Sanders from Gloucester. You are going to put your name in for the three choirs. You are going to put the head of the job, aren't you? And your name's being mentioned for the three choirs. And so I did. And I didn't know about that. And when I went for an interview, it was a very strange affair because the interview was totally unmemorable. The chapter sat there, I sat here, and they didn't seem to know what to say. It was ever so funny. They didn't mention the Three Choirs Festival. They didn't mention the Choral Society. They made no mention of the boys, where they came from, how many there were. They made no mention of the lay clerks. All the things you'd want to know about when you become an organist of a cathedral. Um, they don't even talk much about the number of services. I really can't remember what we did talk about. <laughs> but I suddenly found myself with the job. And my first association with the organ loft at Head of the Cathedral um, concerns Robert Green as well, so I'm going to embarrass him again. My first association was inauspicious. I had been appointed in April 1974 and subsequently went to have a look round. Even some time drew near, and I asked Robert Green, the assistant organist who was on duty that day, if I might sit with him for the service. He readily agreed, and I took my place at his side in the organ loft. Soon after he began to play, smoke began to issue from beneath the bottom row of keys. Smoke. And he turned to me and said, he doesn't usually do this. <laughs> <laughs> and that valiantly carried on with the service. The choir, I remember vividly, the choir was singing Wood in D. And as it was the 20th evening, the psalm was 104 which had the very apt line, if he do but touch the hills, they shall smoke. <laughs> Halfway through, the Dean's verger appeared with a big red fire extinguisher with the words, you might need this, sir. <laughs> I said, well, how does he work? I don't know, sir, is he? <laughs> and uh, so at the end of the service, then by the time we reached the end of the service, there was a pall of black smoke over overhead. And, and the dean and the canon or two appeared in the loft immediately afterwards wondering what had happened and I remember saying to the dean I thought his organ needed rebuilding. <laughs> he reluctantly had to agree with me but said he had no idea where the money for such an enterprise might be forthcoming. <laughs> After the bustle of Birmingham, Hereford in 1974 seemed a relaxed and leisurely place. There were some lovely old fashioned shops in High Town. The local laundry still delivered to the close. It was also possible to have a quiet drink in the pub opposite the West Front without being deafened by incessant pop music. <laughs> the cathedral similarly seemed serene and unhurried. 
The chapter clerk was a much loved and respected local solicitor who had inherited the position of his father, and his clerk stood at a high desk in a dusty office which could have come straight out of Dickens. He dealt only with chapter legal matters, and any other administration came from the dean's study by means of a postcard through the letterbox. Though I quickly learned to double-check for possible funerals in the current issue of the local newspaper. <laughs> the cathedral shop was a table by the north door displaying a few picture postcards with, if I remember clearly, an honesty plate for the money. And the Mappamundi stood in its old wooden casing to the left of the organ loft door, illuminated by a 60 watt bulb if you could find the switch. <laughs> I passed it every day and always meant to study it in detail, but never actually ever managed to find the time. <laughs> However, the cathedral gave me the opportunities I needed, though I quickly discovered that it suffered from a perpetual shortage of money. My first big event was most important, as Ruth and I were married in the cathedral um, on the 22nd of February, 1975. Um, a ceremony distinguished by the presence of the combined choirs of Birmingham and Hereford cathedrals and their combined bell ringers in the tower who worked overtime for most of the day. The following week, a letter of protest from a well known local agnostic appeared in the Hereford Times <laughs> complaining of the prolonged bell ringing, to be answered in the following issue by the explanation that it was only the organist's wedding and probably wouldn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> I had started in September 1974 with the immediate difficulty that I had to find three new lay clerks, and this was far from easy. Fortunately, I inherited from Richard Lloyd, my predecessor, a very promising set of 18 boys with several outstanding musicians among them, and they blossomed very rapidly. We had to get ourselves into some sort of good order fairly quickly, as 1976 was to be celebrated as the 1300th anniversary of the foundation of the diocese, with lots of special services and events. And I remember 1975 as the year of many meetings and conferences in preparation for them. 1976 was also the centenary of the death of S.S. Wesley, the famous old former organist, and it would also be the year of my first Hereford Three Choirs Festival. To crown it all, we were selected to host the Royal Maundy Service in Holy Week. We also cut our first commercial disc of the music of S.S. Wesley, and some of us took part in a TV film about it. I was a sleeping vicar choral. <laughs> I looked lovely in that 18th century dress, but I didn't have to say anything. Um, all these events imposed enormous responsibilities on the organist and choir, but in the end everything went splendidly and we emerged exhausted but triumphant, and I certainly felt by then that I'd got the measure of running the very musical life of Hereford Cathedral. Throughout all this time the organ was limping along, leaking like a sieve, siphoning from time to time, and keeping the tuner busy as it is best to keep it going. Much of the combination piston action had been burnt out by the shorting of the electric wiring in the console, which had so enlivened my first visit, and inevitably expensive repairs could not be long delayed. In the gathering in the Dean's drawing room after the morning service, the Duke of Edinburgh said to me, this is my name dropping moment, <laughs> the Duke of Edinburgh said to me, um, what did he say? I must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the Duke of Edinburgh said to me, he thought my plumbing needed some attention. <laughs> he did. So loud were the wind leaks and I wholeheartedly agreed with him. Though he didn't offer to have it to pay to have it repaired. But shortly afterwards, Bulmers, the local cider firm, did offer to have the pay to have the organ rebuilt. I went and asked for the money and through the good offices of Peter Pryor, their managing director. And in 1977, the instrument was magnificently rebuilt by Harrison and Harrison Durham, who restored it to absolutely pristine condition without in any way altering its Willis, Willis, Willis character. From this point on, I had an ecstatic love affair with a glorious instrument.
moment and never cease to give thanks for my good fortune in finding myself the custodian of one of the most beautiful organs in the country. By the late 1970s, the cathedral choir had settled down um, with, with a stable team of lay clerks, and we managed to enlarge the setup by adding three supernumerary singers for weekends and special occasions, and making available three similar places to any gifted young singer from the school sixth form who might be contemplating all the scholarships of Oxford and Cambridge. Over the years, this produced some excellent young singers. Um, as our professionalism grew, blend, balance, and ensemble began to emerge, and, and you know we began to be worth listening to. Also, I was told, and we produced, we, we produced several CDs during this period. And so on. One of our most popular was a disc of psalms, which, uh, which um, what was it called? Um, Priory, Neil Collier of Priory um, asked us. We, we made a recording of. Um, an Easter day in Matins for him, and, and uh, he liked the psalm, so he said, Could you do a few psalms? So we did, and I think they sold quite well. Um, in the 1980s, we did all the things you do. We did eight choral services a week, all full choir. We didn't do boys only and men only, that sort of thing. So it was full choir eight times a week, so it was quite a program. Um, in the 1990s, we appeared several times on TV, the most important being a Good Friday performance with orchestra of John Rutter's Requiem in the presence of the composer. And also during that period, we did, incident, we did incidental music for several radio and TV plays. Concerts, recitals, recordings, visits to parishes, carol services, overseas tours, and special occasions of every description crowded upon the memory. Um, but above all, we tried without ceasing to make the eight fully choral services we sang every week as nearly perfect as we possibly could. This was our raison d'etre, the offering of the Opus Dei to the highest possible professional standards, and everything we did stemmed from that. Being only human, of course, we often fell short of what we were aiming at, but even after 27 years of hard labour, I never tired of the daily service and relished the recurring, the recurring challenge of trying to make it something special, right up to my final evening song. I particularly love the Psalms for the Day, um, which we did. Um, so we had our full psalm selection every day, and, and I got to love them dearly. I loved singing them. And, and the words of the psalms get into your subconscious. And the words from the psalm which, which, which are relevant to every human situation, they are the most wonderful thing. So just to, to, uh, to, uh, I'll just play you Psalm 23, just so you can hear a bit of it. Uh,
An area which gave me immense pleasure was my work with Hereford Choral Society. Right from the start we took to each other and for 27 years I rarely missed a Monday rehearsal. The Society was wonderfully served by a committee who weren't afraid of hard work and were prepared to take risks from time to time. Above all, the finances were managed with immense sagacity by a treasurer who was able to forecast income and expenditure with uncanny accuracy, so that the business side of the enterprise was always totally under his careful control. As the years went by, this large cause became extreme, exceedingly assured in their performances and we gave many memorable concerts of some of the greatest works in the repertory, usually accompanied by orchestra to camera under the benign and brilliant leadership of Kenneth Page. The rehearsals had a wonderful atmosphere of fun and hard work and I always looked upon Monday night as a happy evening of music making among, uh, among my friends. The Three Choirs Festival was another yearly event which occupied a good deal of my time and attention. It was an enormous undertaking when it was Hereford's turn to stage it, and even in the Gloucester and Worcester years there was still a great deal for the Hereford organists and singers to do. It was a privilege to work with some of the finest soloists of the day and with world famous orchestras, and, they were, and, and though they were often a great challenge to perform, one remembers the stimulation of tackling new commissions and liaising with composers over their interpretation. It was all very exciting, even not a little hair-raising at times, was thrilling to get to know some very great musicians who had the faith to trust you in the first performances of their works. Over the years we had some wonderful folk on the festival committee who worked immensely hard to make it all happen, not least in the raising of the necessary funds. However, it was ultimately the responsibility of the organist to select the musical content of the main programmes, and a daunting task as one tried to achieve a balance between the familiar and the unfamiliar, the old and the new, while keeping a very sharp eye on the box office. However, on balance, our head of the programmes usually seemed to work, and as we almost always performed packed houses, they obviously attracted the patrons. It was also wonderfully stimulating to work closely with my good friends, the late Dr. John Sanders of Gloucester and the, Dr. John, and the, late, the now late Dr. Donald Hunter of Worcester on festival matters, as they were two of the finest core and the finest and most experienced core and orchestral conductors in the country. And they were marvellous colleagues and I learned a devil of a lot from them, I really did. So we'll just have a call or something from a more recent three choirs. Um, it, it, we, we, we broadcast a lot of the stuff we did, particularly with non commissions and in, 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 the, in you know, Herbal, we usually, usually did have a big new commission. And just a bit of nostalgia, as it, I, I came across an old recording of a broadcast um, uh, when we broadcast the first performance of Book Satan by William Mathias, wonderful great piece, and we, we joined it with a, a, a Nelson Mass to start off the program, and then a horn concerto in the middle of this great new piece, um, and the Bee Band. But I thought just to raise the spirits a bit, here, here's just a few odd um, chords from the start of the Nelson Mass, just to the three years ahead, of course. The Nelson Mass wasn't written for, for Nelson, but Haydn added trumpet calls at the end of the Benedictus to celebrate Nelson's victory at the Battle of the Nile, and the great man heard a performance of the Mass at Eisenstadt in 1800. In his own catalogue of his music, Haydn called the work Missa in Angustis, and this is usually translated rather loosely as Mass in Time of Peril, a reference to France's gradual domination of Europe at that time. The Mass is scored for an unusual orchestral ensemble of three trumpets, drums, organ, and strings. There weren't any other wind parts because players were in short supply in Eisenstadt when Haydn wrote the piece in 1798. The Mass has the usual six sections, beginning with the start of dramatic Kyrie. Both the Gloria and Credo are conceived as three movement cycles. After that comes the Sanctus and Benedictus, and the Mass ends with the Agnus Dei. This is in two sections, 
with slow, solemn music leading to a fast, joyful conclusion at the words Dona Nobis Pace, give us peace. The four soloists in this performance are the soprano Julie Kennard, the contralto Penelope Walker, the tenor Brian Burrows, and the bass Peter Savage. With the Three Choirs Festival Chorus and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Barry Griffiths, conducted by Roy Massey. Since his return in 2001 to his old stamping ground, he has developed the, the traditions with great imagination and a very sure touch. And undoubtedly the music of Hereford Cathedral is now in very safe hands indeed. The last quarter of the 20th century saw great developments both in the spiritual and national life of cathedrals. As parochial worship declined, cathedral worship flourished afresh, and at the same time the buildings became increasingly visited and appreciated by thousands of visitors from all over the world. 
Cathedrals have responded to this growth in tourism by the provision of shops, toilets, restaurants, tour guides, and sometimes admission charges. Their finances have benefited accordingly, as have their restoration funds, and this is all to the good. Though costs in all areas have continued to escalate alarmingly. Their doors are open to ever more parochial contacts, diocesan services and events, and art exhibitions, concerts, recitals, broadcast, recording, TV, filming, and media coverage of all kinds. And there is often a danger of this getting out of hand. A dean can become, whether he likes it or not, an uneasy mixture of pastor, chief executive, and fundraiser, and with a chapter as a board of directors aided by numerous lay assistants. It becomes increasingly difficult in some places to combine a house of prayer with a busy tourist destination. And it is often an enormous problem to preserve the atmosphere and peace of the building. But by and large, the services are still faithfully performed and the acts of choral worship are often appreciated by congregations enlarged by a mixture of tourists, pilgrims, worshippers, musicians, and the totally bewildered. Most places have a big Sunday morning choral Eucharist as their main service for the entire cathedral community. And this, I think, is the greatest development of this late 20th century cathedral renaissance. Here, dignified ceremonial, good music, liturgy, preaching, and congregational club participation combined in a great act of worship in a glorious architectural space. And to have been a cathedral organist during such an exciting development was a great opportunity. Suffice to say, had I been in another profession throughout my working life, I would almost certainly have played a church organ and conducted a choir as a hobby. As it turned out, I did for a profession what in other circumstances I would have done for relaxation and to have been enabled to do so in a great cathedral with supportive deans and chapters and working with a succession of gifted boys and lay clerks amid a tolerant, kindly and appreciative community has been an almost unbelievable privilege and pleasure. With the encouragement and unfailing support and assistance of my dear wife to help me, the lot certainly fell unto me in a fair ground when I went there with it, and without any doubt, I had a goodly heritage in that lovely place.
listen to those wonderful histories and the wonderful reminiscences, the odd joke or two, <laughs> oh yes, about life at Hereford. Thank you so much for coming. It has been an absolute joy. And they do say that the sign of a good cathedral choir is by the standard of their psalm singing. We heard Psalm 23 and there were very few cathedrals, if any, that could surpass that. Thank you once again, Robin.